Welcome to the Living Well Church podcast and thanks for tuning in today. Our mission as a church is to help people find faith in Jesus and a life of purpose and hope. You're about to watch a message that will challenge you, inspire you, encourage you and most of all point you to Jesus and the life of purpose and hope he has planned for you. So lean in and enjoy and let God speak into your life. Um, it's great to see you this morning. It's great to be here. And I'm just, I just get this sense that the Lord over the last few weeks has been doing something in us and is taking us on a little bit of a journey and is changing us um, each week. And I've been talking to the Lord about where he's wanting us to go and what's he, what is he wanting to do within our hearts. And those of you that have maybe just joined us today or maybe you've missed a couple of weeks. I'll just um, kind of summarize what I think has been happening. So a few weeks ago, I spoke, and I spoke about the sovereignty of the Lord, the authority, the power of the Lord. And a lot of us came forward to be anointed, to say the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us, that we won't be um, survivor people, but we'll be people who live with real authority and in real power. And then after that week, Joe spoke, and he spoke about the love of God. You know, we heard a bit more about that this morning, how the Lord just lavishes his love upon us. And then last week, Jack came, and he spoke about the grace of God, and how, the, you know, the Lord just lavishes his grace upon us. And also last week, we had this sense that there was change, that the Lord wanted to change something within us. And we are, as a church, changing slightly like geographically as we're planting Elsham. And there's exciting stuff happening as we kind of embark on new ground over there. But the Lord, I think, as well, in preparation for that, wants to change something within our hearts. And so we've been looking at that, and I've been praying into that. And as a preaching team, I don't think it's any coincidence, therefore, that we are looking at now the, the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. And I just get this sense, and I hope that you're with me, and I hope that you would just allow your hearts to be really open this morning, because I really think that the Lord wants to take us from a place where maybe we are bogged down with worldly worries, worldly mindset of having this survivor, victim mindset where we don't feel loved, where we don't know the Lord's grace, where we think we have to still earn stuff. And actually, he wants to flip us completely, and he wants us to be a people who live completely and utterly in the Spirit. Yeah, where the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us, moment by moment, day by day. And I'm hoping that through this series, um, we will become these great spiritual warriors. Yeah, because at the end of the series, we finish with Love Dover. And how amazing would it be that we are these spiritual warriors, not, not worried or concerned by the ways of the world, but actually just full of the Lord's Holy Spirit, ready to declaim, like proclaim his glory in the streets of Dover, ready for the transformation that could happen in that town. That's exciting, isn't it? Yeah? So that's what I'm hoping might be, I feel like the Lord is wanting to do. So in Galatians 5, I just say it says, Chapter 5, sorry, verse 16, it says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh literally desires are what are contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit is what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another, so that you cannot do both of them. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. 
They are amazing things to live by, aren't they? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And this morning, I get the sheer joy of speaking on joy. Now, I've agonized over this, okay? And the reason why I've agonized over this is because, and you might have to bear with me a little bit, um, I think you can teach a little bit of how, how to be kind. Yeah, I do. I think these are some kind things to do, church. Let's go be kind. I think you can teach that, can't you? I think you can teach a bit about how to be loving. Here's some loving things to do, church. Let's go be loving. But joy is a real state of being. It's a real state of our soul formed by the Holy Spirit. It's not something you can fake. You can't fake being joyful. You can maybe fake being okay, being fine, maybe even being happy, but not joy. Joy is deep. Joy is deep-rooted. It's this absolute state of being, this constant that doesn't change. Secondly, and you might think, Beth, that's really offensive, but (laughs) hear what I'm about to say, and you think about it too. I can think of many people who I would describe as kind, who I would describe as patient, who I would describe as loving, But just think for a minute, if I said to you, can you name me somebody that within two words you would describe them as joyful, can you think of someone? And you might be thinking, hey Beth, (laughs) hello. But I genuinely struggled. I genuinely struggled to think of somebody with maybe the top one or two words I would use to describe them as joyful. And then as I was thinking about this, The Lord just provoked me and said to me, have you, and you like as a people, been stripped of your joy? Have we been stripped of our joy? And that we in England or in the church, as a Christian people, have we been stripped of our joy? Because surely... We have one of the greatest reasons to be joyful. Yeah? We know the king of kings, lords and lords. We know the person that flew the stars into space. We know the person who created this whole earth and who sent his son to die on a cross for us to give us eternal life. We know all of that. We know that we've got a home secure and in heaven. We should be like whooping every day. (laughs) We should be dancing our way through life. And yet I can't really describe myself as joyful. And just think for yourself for a second, would you describe yourself as joyful even though you know you possess eternal life and you know you have a relationship with the person that created this whole entire universe? Would you describe yourself as joyful? And so I stumbled here and I thought, how do we recuperate that joy? Because maybe you can think back in your life, maybe there were some times that you can think of that you think, yeah, I I was joyful then. So what's robbed it? Or maybe every now you can think, I'm joyful sometimes, or maybe at this point in the week or that point in the week, but what's robbed it? Because I know where the Lord wants to take us. He doesn't want us to be these people with a survivor mentality who on a Sunday maybe get a seal on our foreheads, but then throughout the week are still downcast and downtrodden, who learn what joy is on a Sunday, but then still go out in the week and are still downcast and downtrodden. The Lord doesn't want us to live like that. He doesn't want us to live in the flesh. He wants us to live in the spirit. So I want to try and look at this morning, what gives us this genuine joy? And I think the key is found in John 15. And this was read at our wedding, when it was read at our wedding, I was a little bit like, why has this been read at our wedding? It's nothing to do about me or Johnny or love. <laughs> and then, <laughs> but over the years, it has spoken to me hugely. And it's because it's about the real relationship you, we should have with Christ and the perspective that we should have of God, as Marcus opened with this morning. So if you want to turn to it, John 15, it's Jesus speaking. And he says, I am the true vine, 
my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. And if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my father's, to my Father's glory, that you will bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as you have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. So we have here Jesus using this analogy of a vine and some branches. And I'm just going to pick out three key things from here. And these three things, I think, helps us to understand why then at, in that verse 11, Jesus then can say, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. So the first thing, I'm hoping we all know, we all know what a vine is, don't we? Yes, you're all looking at me like a Beth, come on. Yep, so a wonderful grapevine is the type of vine, not an ivy vine, but a beautiful grapevine is what's being taught about here, where you've got that one key strong vine, lots of little branches coming off it, then bearing kind of grapes of these beautiful kind of fruit coming off it. And the first thing that I want to talk to you about is, Jesus says... I am the vine. And then he says, you are the branches. And sometimes, I think in life, we get that a little bit the wrong way around. And sometimes, we become the vine, and Jesus becomes a branch. Now, sometimes that's through complete default. So sometimes, our very inner nature is one maybe where people see us as someone who's strong, someone who can be relied upon, someone who could be depended upon. And maybe in your family or circumstance now, you feel a little bit like a vine. You are that person that holds everything together. And maybe right now I'm speaking, I'll just ask the Holy Spirit just to come and convict. Some of you are thinking, yeah, I know, I am that person. I'm that person that holds everyone together and I'm tired, and it's hard work. But you are the person who actually, if you're being honest, somehow, just by default, because people see you as strong, you've become the vine. And maybe it's your brothers or your sisters or your children or your neighbor or the person who lives down the road or that person in church that's become a branch coming off of you. And you're constantly, you're the one constantly giving out to them and constantly supporting. And actually what's really happened is you've become the vine and they are now the branches. What might happen, now I have to put my hands up to this one and say completely guilty, is maybe you've become the vine because you think you are independent. <laughs> you think you can do it by yourself. You don't need to ask for help. You don't want to ask for help. And actually, the truth is, you kind of love spinning plates. You love it when people come up to you and go, oh, Beth Boxall, how do you do all of that? You, you do. How do you do all of that? And you think, yes, but deep down you know I am dropping plates like nobody's business. <laughs> really, I'm just making a big smashing mess. 
And maybe that's ringing true for some of you, that actually some of you know that you love taking on a lot. And you've put yourself in that position that you've become the vine. And in those, both of those scenarios, Jesus is just a branch. He's something you reach out to when you need him. You have those survival prayers in the morning of, Lord, I really need you to help me out today. I really need this and this. And Lord, I just pray for that person. And I'll go and do this for that person. But can you help me get there on time? And, and they're your prayers. They're branch out prayers. They're reach out prayers. You're teaching, treating Jesus like the branch instead of like the vine. So maybe that's one thing that actually your joy has been completely stripped. You're tired, you run down, because pretty much you've put yourself in the wrong place. You've not put Jesus as the vine and you as the branch. Instead, um, you've, yeah, you've put you as the vine and he as the branch. So therefore, secondly, the important thing is that you are connected in the right way. And the branches are connected into the vine. And in a vine, the strength, the nutrients, the goodness, the sap, everything a branch needs to grow and survive comes from the vine. Yep, the vine is the one that provides the life source. It's in the ground. It sucks up all that nutrients from the ground. This is my biology class for today. Um, Nitrogen, let's pretend. <laughs> Oxygen, let's pretend. People in the audience who know real biology are cringing right now. Water, H2O. Uh, from the ground, yeah? I'm going to really impress you with some knowledge in a minute. Hang on, wait for this one. And it shoots up the vine, goes into the branches. And so those branches have got to be connected into the right way. Yeah, that is the order of the source of life. That is the order of the nutrients. It doesn't go from the branch to the vine. That's ridiculous. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't happen. It goes from the vine into the branches. The only way, let's get ready for this bit of biological knowledge, everyone. The only way it goes the other way is from the leaves that absorb the chlorophyll. Is that right? From the sunlight and goes through the leaves. So the only other source of light it gets from, the only other source of nutrients is from the sun. I love that. That the only way that the branches can get the right nutrients is from the vine and from the sun. It's like the only way we can really get what we need is from Jesus and from the Lord. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? We can't get it from anywhere else. Any other kind of source is going to be absolutely useless to us. All we need is what's from the vine and from the sun. And that's the right way of being connected. I don't know if you've read the leader's message this week. It's from Joe. And Joe um, wrote about how last week um, I said in the meeting that we need to listen to God. And Joe uses this great little analogy in the leader's message. I really like it. He says, we all have maybe one of those annoying friends that keep talking and talking and talking. Yeah, that don't shut up. I'm that person, sorry, people who are my friends. But that keep talking. And he said, don't be like that with God. Don't have that relationship with God where you just constantly ramble onto him. Let's have that relationship where we listen and download from him. We've got to make sure that connection goes the right way. And you know, when I thought about when have I had genuine joy, there were times I could think about in my life, like when I got married, the times when I held Ralph when he was tiny, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night with him and he would be there. And I can remember those real joy moments. I remember the first time we watched Pinocchio all under the duvet together and you just got that, oh, this feeling of this is great. But there was nothing that compared to some of the times I've been with the Lord. And I'll just quickly describe to you when 
I was 13 and we were at Soul Survivor. And Soul Survivor, for those of you who don't know, is a big Christian youth camp. There's about 10,000 Christians. And we were all in this huge tent and we were just worshipping. And my best friend and I just worshipped for about three hours solid. And we laughed out to the Lord. We cried to the Lord. We called out to the Lord. We shook with the Lord. We just, everything possible. And it was one of my first time experiences of just being completely abandoned and sold out and surrendered before the Lord. And I realized at that point, at 13 years old, there is nothing better that remain, about remaining in the Lord and being with the Lord and the Lord being with you. And these verses talk about being with the Lord. I just want to read. It says, remain in me and I will remain in you. And I realized at 13, there's nothing better than remaining in the Lord and the Lord remaining in you. And bear with me for this next bit. Since that time when I was 13, I've made this conscious effort to make sure that I've regularly remained in the Lord and the Lord remained in me. And what that looks like is when I've had my prayer times or my worship times, there's been those moments where you're so absorbed in the presence and the holiness and the goodness and the majesty of the Lord that you just can't even speak because any earthly words that you dare to usher are just not worthy enough for him. And you're just kind of face down, floored in his holy majesty. And the Lord just, just kind of washes his holy spirit in you. And something happens when you connect like a branch into the vine that his holy spirit just pulsates through that vine and pulsates through you. And it leaves you feeling completely and utterly joyful. It leaves you feeling like you can take on anything in this world because you realize that you live in a different kingdom. And I want to ask you this morning, have you had that? Have you had that connection? Have you had that time with the Lord? where you can't speak in his presence because he so overwhelmed you? Was it a vague memory when you were 13? Was it a few months ago or a year ago at some conference? Or was it last week? Was it a burn on Friday night? Was it last night when you were in your bathtub? Because I'm telling you this, if you want to know the joy of the Lord, you need those moments where you really connect like a branch into the vine and you allow that Holy Spirit power to pulsate right from the roots in heaven. Travel right down to you on the branch on earth. And so if you've never had that, I just want to say today, put yourself into the right perspective. You're the branch. Humble yourself before the Lord. Surrender yourself before the Lord. Go home and at some point make sure that you clear time to spend that time with the Lord. And you can do that in many different ways. On a practical way, you can do that in many different ways. You could simply read the word and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal itself through the word. You could put in worship music and just worship. In Matthew 7, it says, close the door and just pray to your father. But I'm I'm begging you this morning that if that's what I've described is a hazy memory or was even a month ago, make it a regular occurrence. Make it something where you do regularly with the Lord, where he remains in you and you remain in him. Because I'm telling you, that will give you that joy. You will know that the Lord reigns and there'll be no doubt about it in your life. And so the third thing then is then as an outpouring of that, there is growth. 
And in these verses, it talks about the fruit that then comes from the vine to the branch and the fruit that then comes as an outcome. And you know, as throughout the whole Bible, there has been times where fruit has come as an outcome where people have spent that time with the Lord, remaining in the Lord. One of the most famous ones, I think, is in Acts, where Paul and Silas, two of the Lord's uh, kind of followers on earth, after Jesus went back up to heaven, Paul and Silas were in jail. They'd been put in jail because they believed in the Lord. And very simply, in In Acts 16, verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. You know, they were spending that time. (laughs) They knew that they needed to surrender to the Lord at that time. They knew that they were branches. They needed to connect into the vine. They needed some of that Holy Spirit power. They connected in, and then suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once the prison doors flew open. And everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Two people in a place where they are remaining in God and God's remaining in them. They had every right to be lowly. They have every right to have a survivor mentality. How are we going to get through this? We're just in jail. We could rot in here forever. But they didn't. They became branches. They connected into the vine. They worshipped with the Lord. An earthquake came. They still didn't flee from prison. As a result, this jailer now wants to become saved. You can see that beautiful picture of people, branches, connecting into the vine through instantly being born. Yeah? A fantastic picture. Throughout the whole time, we get these illustrations. I'm reading a book at the moment called Dirty Glory, a book who by the person who founded the 24-7 prayer rooms. And it's, it's just constantly people have devoted time to go and remain in the Lord and the Lord remain in them. And there is account after account after account of the fruit that comes from that. There's times in Syria where non-Christian soldiers walk past this prayer room and instead of kind of literally setting fire to it, they walk in and the presence of the Lord floors them and they become Christians. You know? One of my favorite is Francis of Assisi. I love Francis of Assisi. I love how he talks about peace. You know, I love one of our early forefathers and I love reading their stories. And he was actually a really wealthy man. His dad was absolutely loaded. <laughs> and he was this, he had, had, didn't have to do anything in his life, really. And yet the Lord was working on Francis of Assisi. And one day he's in a cave. And in this cave, he literally just spends time on his knees to his father weeping. And he connects into the Lord. And he remains in the Lord, and the Lord remains in him. And you know Francis Cece, you know we know what he goes to do, we know the songs he goes to write. There's account after account. And so I want to just say to these verses, it says, I've told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. And this morning I say to you, I want you to spend time with the Lord. And I know some of you do. I'm not, it's not a kind of a judgment call saying none of us spend time with the Lord, but I'm just saying there must be a reason why we're stripped of our joy. There must be a reason why we're stripped of our joy. And so I think it's time to start being really real with the Lord and being like, I am a branch. I need to connect into the vine and I need to do that really regularly. And you know what? When that happens, who knows the fruit you could bear? And I will say that again. Who knows the fruit you could bear? Because the Bible tells me 
And history tells me that there's phenomenal fruit that could be born from this. And I'll just finish on one of the last things. There is a little bit of a warning in those verses when we don't connect, if we're not connected. Because it talks about those branches withering. So there is a sense that this is something that we need to do because we don't want our Christian journey just to wither. We don't want to get to the ends of our lives and just be a dead branch. That's not good for anyone. That has no purpose for anyone. So I'm going to invite Neil back up here, if that's all right, Neil, and the worship team. And... um, I'm going to ask him just to play behind me, if that's all right, Neil. And I'm just going to start to pray. And I'm actually going to pray a little bit of a prayer of repentance. I'm just going to pray a little prayer which says, sorry, Lord. And if you're with me on that, and the reason why I feel like I need to say sorry is because, A, I put myself as the vine so many times. You know, and sometimes every now and then there's even part of me that wants to be the vine. I want to be the strong one. I want to hold it all together. And I need to apologize to the Lord because I need to know I am just the branch. My job is to bear fruit, not to hold everyone up. I'm never going to bear fruit if I'm the vine. Yeah? So I'm going to apologize for that. And then I'm also going to apologize for all the times, all the nights all the mornings I've chosen to do something completely useless instead of connecting in to the vine instead of connecting into my holy father instead of having those times where I know those groundbreaking moments I could have had day after day with the Lord and then I'm going to finish by saying Lord let's make sure that I remain in you and you remain in me going forward If you're with me with that, I just ask you to stand. And I'm just going to pray over all of us. So Lord, Lord, this morning we just lift our hands and we just say, Lord, whether we're standing or whether we want to kneel and surrender, Lord, I don't mind. But Lord, I just say, we are sorry. Lord, we are sorry. We're sorry for the times that sometimes we've got a wrong perspective, Lord. And maybe even this morning we stand. We came into church feeling like a vine. Maybe that was by complete default. Maybe we put ourselves there, Lord. But we just say, Lord, we are sorry. And Lord, with humble hearts this morning, Lord Jesus, we pray now, Lord, that we are sorry for all those times where we could have had those huge powerhouse, earth-shifting moments with you, Lord. We could have had time connected in with the person who created the universe, but instead maybe we decided to do something completely futile and useless. Lord, we are sorry. But Lord, now going forward, we recognize, Lord, that we need to be a people who are not stripped of our joy, but who need to know the joy of the Lord and that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So, Lord, let us now have a time, Lord, where we connect in with you, where we know our true position as a branch and we hunger and we yearn to bear fruit for you, Lord. And, Lord, let this be a reminder to us that daily, Lord, we make this, we want to just be plugged into you, Lord. Let us make time. Let us lay aside things of the day. Let us make sure we abandon ourselves and surrender, Lord, so that we plug ourselves into the root. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that your grace and your love is so upon us that you have huge plans for us. And Lord, I just pray of this congregation, Lord, and I thank you for the things that you have for them. I pray that they spend time with you, Lord Jesus, so that we see the huge amounts of fruit that can be harvested from them, Lord. Amen. I'll ask you just to stay standing. I'm just going to ask Neil if he can just lead us in worship. And I just ask that this be a time where we just really connect in with our Father.